Rogues Gallery Uncovered. Bad behaviour in period costume. A non-judgmental probe into the scandalous lives of history's greatest libertines, Lotharios and complete bastards. This podcast contains adult themes and a touch of colourful language. Actually, this episode has more than just a touch. There are quite a few F-bombs going off, so keep your head down and take cover if that's likely to be a problem. By the way, apologies for the lack of an episode last week. I was unexpectedly out of the country, which was all very nice, if a little bit exhausting. I hope you've been having a suitably roguish time in my absence. Possibly you were visiting roguesgalleryuncovered.com and checking out the actual galleries of rogues that are on display there. Or perhaps you were signing up to the newsletter, as I noticed a few new names on the list last week. If you're one of them, welcome, you disgraceful reprobate. It was, I will admit, more than a little weird not putting up an episode last week, and I'm definitely glad to be back. I've missed saying things like this. King Kickass, fox tossing, bullfighting, horseshoe bending, rampant shagging, and fine delicate porcelain, with 18th century Europe's most manly monarch, Augustus the Strong. A quick roguish shout out to uh, Mike, who got in touch this week, asking about Victorian rogue Edward Sellen. Be assured, Mike, he's coming. He's coming very, very soon. Also, a big have at you, sir, to a gentleman who signed his name Charles Moen after the duelling rogue of a few episodes ago and who compelled me, and I quote, to keep up the good work, lest I pierce thee. Well, I'm nothing if not easily cowed, sir, and will do as you ask, vis-a-vis the good work. I suppose I'd better get on with it then. The following tale is written in the present tense of the period in which it's set, and as such may contain attitudes and opinions of the protagonists in their times which would today be considered unacceptable. As I'm not a sweary, misogynistic 18th century German fanboy with a thing about feats of manly strength, no really I'm not, Those attitudes and opinions are obviously not mine. Dresden, 1720. Here's a question for you. If all the kings in Europe had a fight right now, who'd win? No armies, no swords, just sleeves up, bare knuckles scrapping. And the last one standing gets to be the winner. George of England? Fuck off. He couldn't punch his way out of a flower garden. No, seriously, if you were betting on a regal, free-for-all scrap, there's only one king worth parting with your money for. And that's Augustus II, Elector of Saxony, Imperial Vicar, Grand Duke of Lithuania, and King of bloody Poland. What? Louis XV? Don't make me laugh. Could he bend a horseshoe with his bare hands? Could he fuck? And I'd like to see Ferdinand VI of Spain fight a wild boar. He'd be crying for his nanny all the way back to Barcelona. A proper king's powerful, a man's man, who takes no shit from anyone. He's a sex-angry Viking who fights like a mad bastard and fucks like an animal. And that's why Augustus gets my vote. And it's why they call him Augustus the Strong. Of course, that's not all they call him. The Saxon Hercules and Iron Hand are just two of the other names people have given him, but you get the idea. He's a big man, taller than Charles II, I'll bet, and he weighs about 19 stone. There are only three things in life that he likes. Showing off how strong he is, having sex with some comely strumpet, and delicate porcelain. He fucking loves bone china. When he was a young man, Augustus travelled all over Europe, admiring the architecture, you know, like a proper art case. All the time looking out for things to break, punch, lift or kill. In Madrid, he was so overcome with the savage challenge faced by the matadors that he drew his sword, jumped into the bullring and cut the head off one himself, with a single stroke. The ladies of the court flocked around him. 
but an unhappy assignation with one of them, Lady Manzera, encouraged him to move on. She had a jealous husband and a vengeful mother. Bad combination. In Venice, he docked his gondola and climbed the trellis, if you know what I mean, of a beautiful widow, who'd apparently been admiring him from afar since the day he'd arrived. This affair came to a bit of a surprising end too, when Augustus found her in bed with a Dominican friar. Bloody monks. Journeying to Florence, he dazzled all who saw him with the brilliance of his livery. One nobleman, consumed by jealousy no doubt, made some sarcastic comment that got back to Augustus, who promptly sent him a note challenging him to a duel. The nobleman, realising that fighting a beast like Augustus would result in him being chopped into pezzi molto piccolo, shat his breeches and then pretended it had all been a terrible misunderstanding. Before he came home, Augustus went back to Venice and joined the army, just so he could fight some Frenchmen, climbed to the top of Mount Etna in Sicily and then got married in a town just outside Nuremberg. He could have lived a life free of responsibility from then on, but shortly after his return home, destiny decided to try his strength. Augustus, you see, never expected to be in charge of anything. He was the second son, so the electorate of Saxony automatically went to his older brother, Johann George. Johann George, though, was undone. By a woman. Typical. Although he was married, Johann was absolutely smitten with his mistress, Magdalena Sibylla. There were rumours that she was actually his half-sister, but that's royalty for you. Anyway, he was so desperate to marry her that one day he tried to stab his wife to death with a sword. He was only prevented by the swift action of a young Augustus who grabbed hold of the blade, cutting his fingers to ribbons in the process. Johann George's wife never gave him any children, which wasn't surprising after that, but Magdalena did. The trouble was that because his daughter was illegitimate, she had no claim on the electorate in the event of his death, and it was a death that wasn't long in coming. You see, in 1694, Magdalena stupidly caught smallpox, and Johann George spent every waking moment until she died gently cradling her head while whispering sweet nothings into her poxed-up earlobes. Now, I'm not sure how it all works. Something to do with bad smells, I think. But not long after that, he caught smallpox too. Three weeks later, he was dead. So, Augustus was now the elector. And to celebrate, he presided over a lavish procession through the streets of Dresden where his supporters at court dressed themselves as ancient Greek and Roman gods. Obviously, Augustus made sure that his wife had a role in the proceedings. She was one of the many virgins escorting Vesta, the goddess of hearth and home. He also made sure that Magdalena had a role in the proceedings too. She played the part of Aurora, goddess of the dawn, and had a place of honour at the front of Apollo's carriage. Remind your wife of her duties while keeping the mistress happy. Augustus clearly had a strong hold on what it takes to make a good marriage. As the new elector, Augustus set out to make himself the Sun King of Saxony, by becoming a patron of the arts to rival Louis himself. You've probably seen all the fancy buildings he put up here in Dresden. This Dresden Castle, the Zwinger Palace, Moritzburg Castle, Pianitz Castle, Hubertusburg Castle. You can't move for bloody castles round here. They say he's going to open up the country's first public museum soon. No idea why. What normal working man would want to walk around a room looking at a load of old fancy stuff? Unless, of course, he could sell it. So that's Dresden, the Florence of the Elbe, all artsy-fartsy. But just in case you're thinking that Augustus was actually a bit soft, let me tell you a story. One day, Augustus was riding his horse through the Saxon countryside when the horse threw a shoe. So he goes to the nearest village and asks the blacksmith to fashion him a replacement. The blacksmith gives him a new horseshoe, but instead of fitting it to his horse, Augustus grips it firmly in his hands and tears it apart like it was a loaf of stale bread. Then he throws the blacksmith a coin and tells him to make another one. In response, the blacksmith, who was himself a particularly muscular fellow, bent the coin between two of his fingers. Augustus thought this powerfully masculine response was hilarious and happily threw him a third coin as payment for another shoe. I'd like to think that the two then wrestled vigorously until they were all covered in sweat, but the story doesn't say that. Augustus would often demonstrate his strength by bending horseshoes. I could watch him doing it all day. You'd also sometimes see him riding through the town, holding a laughing street urchin above his head in each hand while gripping the reins between his teeth. Name me a monarch who does that. 
You can't, can you? 1796, though, was a big year for the strong man. His wife gave birth to their first and only child. His official mistress, Maria Aurora von Königsmark, also gave birth to a child, which no doubt caused harsh words to be exchanged at home, and to top it all off, he became King of Poland. Now, you might wonder how a man born in Saxony can become King of Poland without actually having been born there. It's a good question. When a Polish king dies, you see, his throne doesn't automatically go to his son. The people, at least those who are entitled to vote, decide who's going to be the next king. Candidates for the job make themselves known, and the one with the most votes gets the crown. In 1796, the job became available, and Augustus decided to treat the election process just like he treated everything else, by hitting it until he got his own way. The first thing he did was convert to Catholicism. Poland's a Catholic country, and he thought that this would be a popular move. Nice one. So what if the Protestant ministers in his own country got all up in arms about him dumping his native religion so he'd got a better chance of winning? Winning is what men do. And anyway, he was already their ruler, so they didn't really have a choice. His wife, who, remember, had just given birth to their only child and whom he hadn't talked to about any of this, was livid. She absolutely refused to join him in renouncing her faith, despite the best efforts of Augustus and even her own father. With Europe in shock over his sudden conversion, but Polish voters now certain of his commitment to their church, Augustus felt that he had a good chance. In the royal election, there were 10,000 people eligible to vote, and 10 candidates for them to choose from. The people spoke. And they elected the French candidate, François-Louis, Prince of Conti, who had four-fifths of the vote. This was not because everybody loved him, you understand, it was because the French could afford to pay huge bribes to those who were doing the voting. But Augustus wasn't beaten yet. He sold and pledged vast tracts of land in Saxony to raise enough money to outbribe the French. Wallop! Then he insisted on another vote, which, surprise surprise, he won. So now Poland had two kings, and it became a race to see who could be crowned first. Augustus was in a carriage with his coronation robes on before you could say horseshoe. And by the time French Francois had gotten as far as Danzig, he was already sitting in Krakow with the crown of Poland on his head. Get in! So Augustus was king, but his wife refused to set foot in Poland and was never crowned queen. Her fellow Protestants started calling her the Pillar of Saxony on account of her steadfastness. She still wasn't as strong as her husband, though. Being married to Augustus, however, proved to be too intense, and she left her infant son with her mother and exiled herself to Precht Castle on the banks of the Elbe. Not that Augustus would ever be without female companionship. They reckon he's fathered between 60 and 300 bastards from his many mistresses and conquests. He's like a ram and a stallion combined. While his wife was not supporting him by refusing to turn Catholic, Augustus was also rutting with a woman who was much more understanding. Anna Aloisa Maximilienne Louise von Lamburg, or, as she was more discreetly known, Madame Esteli. She was a married Austrian countess, and Augustus used to pretend to be taking pinches of snuff whenever her husband was in the room, so he could tell her how beautiful she was from behind his hand without him noticing. Then he bought her a pair of earrings that cost 40,000 florins, and the next thing you know, she's inviting him to her bedchamber. The husband was suffering from some kind of feverish sickness at the time, so he was sleeping in a separate room. In between Roger and his wife, Augustus used to pop in to see him, just to ask how he was feeling. He kept dreaming about ghosts, apparently. Anyway, one night, instead of puking into a bucket, Madame Esteli's husband made the most of feeling a little better and crept into his wife's chamber to give her a loving glance while she slept. What he found was Augustus, snoring his head off all over her ample bosom. Needless to say, he was annoyed. But his fury abated when Augustus offered to pay him handsomely for the exclusive use of his wife, providing he gave his name to any bastards that were born as a result. All went well, until Augustus found out that Madame Esteli had been exclusively opening her legs for several other gentlemen at court as well. He gave her 24 hours to pack her cases, which I thought was overgenerous, and threw her out of the country. She was soon replaced by Ursula Katharina of Altenbockum, a Polish princess no less, he seduced her with a big casket of jewels, which is not surprising as he's a great lover of gold and gemstones, importing vast amounts of them from India. 
His goldsmith, Johann Melchior Dinglinger, is one of the finest in Europe. He's certainly one of the busiest. Have you seen his golden coffee service? It's dazzling. After her, he took up with Maria Aurora von Spiegel, who was actually a captured Ottoman lady-in-waiting named Fatima that he met at court. I wonder if she was serving coffee. That's one of the things about Augustus, you see. He's no side to him. If you take his fancy, it doesn't matter what class you are. Unless you're a shop girl or something like that. Oh, and there was Countess Cosell, who Augustus met when her house caught fire and he saw her illuminated by the flames. Her husband, noticing that Augustus was slavering at his wife like a lust-crazed Munsterlander, knew that becoming a cuckold was all but inevitable and asked for a divorce. Cosell, whose name was Anna Constina von Brockdorf, very shrewdly refused to sleep with Augustus until he put down in writing that he would marry her if his wife died. Augustus, thinking with his pecker again, signed away, and the document was given to her cousin for safekeeping. When the two inevitably fell out on account of her meddling in Polish politics, Augustus agreed to give her a pension if she returned the document. She set off to Berlin to get it, but couldn't because her cousin was in prison. Returning empty-handed, she was herself arrested and treated very, very harshly by her captors. Augustus eventually found the document and destroyed it, but he couldn't risk his former mistress telling the story of her abominable treatment by his own police force and the questions it would raise. So he confined her to the picturesque town of Burg Stolpen, where she will no doubt remain until Augustus himself passes away, which won't be for years because he's so incredibly strong. There was a brief fling with the daughter of a Warsaw wine merchant, with whom he stayed on good terms even after their relationship ended. Actually, he made her husband supervisor of the bathrooms at Uyazdu Park. And let's not forget Mademoiselle de Scow, a stunning beauty who was actually a bit of a disappointment. Augustus, you see, had paid her mother a considerable sum of money for access to her daughter, but the girl was still a virgin. Now, she may have been eager for some royal passion, but her inexperience meant that she just lay there like a side of mutton. No fun at all, so he sent her back. Anyway, that's enough about Augustus's mighty penis. What about his other muscles? Bending horseshoes is little more than a parlour trick, you know, for this towering slab of manhood. Have you any idea how strong you've got to be to fight an angry bear? Augustus did just that at the coronation of Joseph I in Augsburg. Two blows of his sword and it was all over. Do you know, just to keep himself in fighting trim, he often asked his servants to release wild boars in his presence just so he could fight those too. But he was most famous around Dresden for tossing. You name it, if it walked on four legs, he enjoyed tossing it high into the air. You should have seen those foxes and badgers go. It's quite the spectator sport, better than bloody tennis. He once held an animal tossing competition here in Dresden where 647 foxes, 533 hares, 34 badgers and 21 wildcats were flung to their deaths. And it goes without saying, Augustus always won. But he didn't just grab them by the tail and chuck them aloft, however, nothing so barbaric. Rather, he had them walk slowly across a special leather sling, with a person standing on either end. When the unfortunate creature was in position, both parties would pull on the string as tightly as they could and Oy! off it would fly. Augustus used to hold his end using just one finger, while two of his strongest courtiers held on to the other. Now that's a man. But what about the porcelain? Like I said, he loves it. Knock over one of his teacups and he'd fucking kill you. It all goes back to when he first became a lector. He'd been all over Europe, remember, and was in love with shiny, precious, valuable things, which he began to collect with an almost obsessional passion. Imagine his excitement when he learned of a young man named Johann Friedrich Bodger, a chemist's apprentice who, it was rumoured, was adept at alchemy and close to discovering the secret of the gold makatinka. This is a legendary substance that can turn base metals into solid gold. Bodger's studies had already caught the attention of the Prussian king Frederick I, who'd kidnapped him and demanded that he finish his experiments in what he described as protective custody. Bodger, however, escaped and was just enjoying his freedom when Augustus found him and locked him up in a similar dungeon in Saxony. Well, that's what you get for being too clever. He was sent to Kornigstein Fortress, the Saxon Bastille, where he spent years stooped over bubbling jars, breathing in all kinds of noxious, toxic fumes. But although he built Augustus the world's largest wine barrel, the Konigsteiner Weinfass, 
It holds 249,838 litres, which would do me for about a weekend. The secret of transmutation eluded him. Fearing for his life if he continued to disappoint, Butger turned his attentions to finding out how another valuable and mysterious material was made. Porcelain. Porcelain cups, plates and bowls have been imported from China for centuries, their rare delicacy making them hugely prized and very expensive. What's wrong with honest pewter? That's what I say. Anyway, Augustus wanted the biggest bone china cabinet in the world. Of course he did. He loved white gold so much that he once traded 600 of his most prized cavalrymen for a single consignment of Chinese porcelain. The porcelain dragoons, they called them. Butger may have been rubbish at turning lead into gold, but eventually he worked out how the Chinese made porcelain and Augustus was overjoyed. He gave Butger his own factory stroke laboratory at Albrechtsburg Castle in Meissen. I dare say though he would have preferred his freedom. Saxony became the home of European produced porcelain, although the bloody Viennese have recently set up a competing factory. To know for sure that you're holding genuine Meissen ware, just look at the bottom. And if you find the symbol of the crossed swords embossed on it, then you know it's for real. I've got a porcelain figure at home on my nightstand. It's of a tall, virile man in a simple hunting coat with two urchins on his back, throwing a badger in the air with one hand while cutting a bear's head off with the other. Can you guess who it is? There's really little more to add to the story of Augustus the Strong. Yes, there are military campaigns against the Swedes that, to be honest, didn't turn out that well for him. But this podcast isn't about the great events of history. Rather, it's about the furtive fumbling that was going on under a nearby hedge while those events were taking place. So I will brazenly skip over Mattus' military. Aside from his legendary feats of strength, and let's be very happy that fox tossing never really caught on outside of his court and his collection of porcelain. On the subject of which, do you ever get really paranoid in a china shop that you'll suddenly start flailing your arms around for no reason and cause thousands of pounds worth of damage? Or is that just me? Aside from those two things, the two other lasting legacies that Augustus has left posterity are 1. The Order of the White Eagle Poland's highest honour, which, while it wasn't awarded during communism, was never actually abolished, and when communism ended in the region, it started to be awarded again, making it one of the oldest consistently awarded honours still around in Europe. Lech Wałęsa was given one. And two, the wonderfully named Grand Musketeers Company, which is one of Poland's oldest schools for military officers. And let's be honest, who wouldn't want to be a Grand Musketeer? To tell you the truth, I'm pretty amazed that there hasn't been more than one movie based on this remarkable Bavarian beast, but if you do fancy seeing Augustus on the silver screen, you can check out a 1936 Polish-German co-production titled, imaginatively enough, Augustus the Strong, starring opera singer and actor Michael Bone. Augustus died in Warsaw in 1733, his great strength having turned to fat. He was said to be both diabetic and obese when he died. His body lies in the Wawel Cathedral in Krakow, hope I pronounced that right, while his heart is interred at Dresden Castle. I'm sure it isn't, but wouldn't it be great if it had been placed first in a jar of the finest porcelain? Next time on Rogue's Gallery Uncovered. Love School. Learning the horizontal arts and much more from a revolutionary sex education pioneer who taught everyone a thing or two, with Ninon de Lonclo. Now I'm getting back into the swing of things, I really hope that you enjoyed this week's episode. Don't forget that my usual request to leave a nice review or a high rating, if you can, and if you're so inclined, will still be very much appreciated. And if you do fancy getting in touch with roguish suggestions, comments on the podcast, or just general smut and gossip, then I'd love to hear from you. Simon at roguesgalleryonline.com. The address is in the show notes. Anyway, that's all I have for now. Have a great week, stay roguish, and I'll see you yesterday.